let's say I'm renting a property for for me for one thousand pounds per month. Um, I can then rent it on a room by room basis. Let's say five hundred pounds per month, for example. Minus bills, you're left with quite a strong profit. So there's different ways it can be structured, um, and there's other costs that's involved. But that's essentially how it works. I was very inspired by people around me. Initially, you know, my parents, you know, who are very hardworking, um, especially my mum, you know, who's um, what used to work two jobs and run her own business, you know, just to put food on the table. So that's kind of what made me realize I want to work hard so I can actually provide for her as well. People wouldn't necessarily be talking to me for the sake of Denzel, but more because I'm a property guy. So I'll be like, I'll be at a party. I remember uni first, I was at a party. There's me just trying to enjoy, oh, Denzel, can you teach me about property? And that's something I just used to hate. Like, I just like, oh, like, anything that's negative in your life, you kind of put that away and then you just focus on the positive. And then with that, you now have to start with clarity. So what do you actually want? Because a lot of times we're working towards something that we don't even know what we're working towards. Welcome to the Valuable Podcast, where there's value in every conversation. I'm your host, Victor Sasanya, and today I am joined with Denzel Jones, a property entrepreneur who has sourced over £2 million worth in property. In this episode, we learn about the different property deals Denzel exploits and how he upholds his reputation, as well as balancing friendships, being accountable and setting goals. You founded your own company called DJ Property Solutions. So can you talk to me a bit about um, how you founded it and what exactly does your company do? Yeah, so with DJ Property Solutions, you know, after working with him for quite a while, I said to myself, I want to now, you know, make a success for myself. So there's a model that I use, which goes cash flow first, then profits and then wealth preservation. So I said to myself, I need to focus on my cash flow. And I split that into two things. So first is financial independence. And that's when I started with my deal sourcing. So I know that I can, you know, live off my own works rather than necessarily someone else's. So deal sourcing is essentially when I may have a good deal, I have an investor who wants to deal, and I've sort of put the two together and then I get fear of that. So I started that um, in 2019, um, and that was around my first time um, when I just started university. And from there, um, I was, you know, just networking, going to different events, finding different clients that they can, you know, I could provide value to them and find them a deal. In addition, when it came to 2020, I then started something called Rent to Rent. So Rent to Rent is essentially, um, let's say you're the landlord and usually it's a landlord who's tired, so who, you know, doesn't really want anything to do with their property. So I have to provide a women's situation which, you know, provides a solution for you and takes the property off your hands to make it stress-free for yourself. So normally the agreements are about three to five years, and essentially, I'm guaranteeing you a rent for three to five years. Then in the agreement, with the permission of um, you know the landlord, I can then rent it out to Airbnb on a nightly basis, or as I mentioned before, HMO too. So like, if you're a student, you'll know of a HMO, a room-by-room -room basis. What does HMO stand for? House of Multiple Occupancy. Okay, so you basically guarantee a landlord rent for yeah. a fixed amount of years. And then you use that property to bring an income anywhere you can through Airbnb and through renting it out. But isn't that risky? Because if you're guaranteeing an income, which is fixed, and yeah. your income that you perceive is fluctuating, how does one manage sort of that that unbalance? And is it actually mm -hmm. profitable? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I think one thing that's very important is before you get into a rent to rent is to do something we call your due diligence. And that's essentially you know, doing research on the area to ensure that there is actually a demand. So there's different ways which you can assess the demand in the area, such as talking to local agents, putting fake ads out there to make sure that there's a demand for actually your services. Um, so the benefits, I guess, to the landlord as well is that times like COVID and stuff, when, you know, a lot of landlords experience voids, if you guarantee them a rent, they know that they're going to have a guaranteed income, which is hassle-free for the three to five year period. So it provides them with a solution as also you can benefit off it as well. Um, in regards to your question about profitability, yes, it is. Um, as I mentioned, you know, as, as a sort of an example, let's say I'm renting a property for for me for one thousand pounds per month. Um, I can then rent it on a room by room basis. Let's say five hundred pounds per month, for example. Minus bills, you're left with quite a strong profit. So there's different ways it can be structured, um, and there's other costs that's involved. But that's essentially how it works. And what made you so focused? on on property like i'm sure um you've heard of different lucrative ways to make money such as drop shipping reselling um so many different things that people are doing right now trading etc um did you ever 
dibble and dabble into that or have you always been on the property sort of entrepreneurship path yeah so actually to be fair before property um i did actually start with drop shipping so i had a little bit of success with drop shipping i was um selling sportswear um so i think i started that about year 10 or year 11 and yeah that that's what i was doing initially because i knew similarly that's something i can do with sort of low barriers to entry but it can be profitable over time, I kind of realised that that's not really what I want to do because um, with me, I like human interaction. I like, you know, going out there, meeting people. And with dropshipping, um, it was just sort of behind your screen and I had a bit of issues with, you know, the delivery time and things like that. So that's when I was looking for other methods um, in which I can actually, you know, build wealth. And how long did that dropshipping experience last for? So that was about about six to seven months. Um, yeah, six to seven months dropshipping. And... For the audience that's listening that don't know what dropshipping is, what is dropshipping? Dropshipping is where you um, you make use of an outside provider and you essentially have a store and customers buy from your store. But instead of the stock going to your house, it goes directly from the supplier to the customer's house. And what sort of company does that? Like, Did you use, did you get someone to ship it out for you or... Yeah, so I use a provider called Shopify, and I think that's what most people use um, because it has a 14-day trial, free trial, and then you can just experiment different strategies and then go on that way. One thing I've noticed about you is that from a young age, you were very interested in making money and making income and you know building businesses, etc. So I'm just curious to know where that stemmed from. Was that because of a lack of money? Was that because the people who you were around, such as friends, mm -hmm. um, were very motivated or money motivated, should I say? So where did that passion or drive stem from? Yeah, I think initially it started from, you know, growing up, um, we had a lot of good times, but also a lot of bad times. So, you know, going through some financial struggles, um, it really made me realise, you know, when I'm older, I don't want to have to go through this again or don't want my kids to go through these type of struggles. So I was very inspired by people around me. Initially, you know, my parents, you know, who are very hardworking, um, especially my mum, you know, who's um, worked, used to work two jobs and run her own business, you know, just to put food on the table. So that's kind of what made me realise I want to work hard so I can actually provide for her as well um, as a thank you for all that she's done for me. Um, moving on, my cousins, um, friends around me, and just listening to different motivational speakers, you know, you know, Eric Thomas, as you know, Tony Robbins, that kind of instilled in me the drive to actually, you know, make something for myself. Yes, yes. And big up all the mums um, out there. I think, you know, mum is a <laughs> yeah. absolutely superhero job. Um, similar to yourself, like my mum has played a massive role in my life in terms of getting me to where I am today so yeah. um yeah big couple of moms if I've got any any mothers listening but um and you grew up in Kent right so yeah. um is that where your your mom sort of grew up or your family grew up or yeah so initially um so both my parents were born in Sierra Leone where originally from um but my mom moved to London you know when she was young um and yeah they moved to Gravesend just before I was born, because um, my brother was actually born in London, who's older than me, we moved to Gravesend to kind of get away from that lifestyle, and um, you know, surrounded by gangs and stuff, which could have been in London and Gravesend, which is um, quite a good area um, to start my journey. Okay, so your mum actually worked so hard to move the family to a to a better area. Um, I yeah. guess that you were um, less prone to violence or gangs did you say yeah. so um how was your education like schooling did you school in gravesend yes yeah, so i schooled in gravesend um starting from primary school it was actually a really good primary school um it was one where there was a lot of successful parents so growing up i would always ask the parents you know they would have big houses nice cars so i'd always be asking them what do you do for a living and i guess that as well um inspired me when i was young because certain things I didn't have compared to my peers, which made me actually motivated to go and make something for myself. Um, moving to secondary school, it was a bit of the opposite. I went to one of the worst schools, I think, in my area. Um, when we finished year 11, only 50% of us actually achieved um, A to C in GCSEs um, in English or math. So it wasn't the best um, secondary school. But again, you know, I think with every um, situation that you're in, there's always a lesson learned from it. So... With that one, I, I kind of learned how to deal with different types of people that I came across. Um, you know, some people who are from disprivileged backgrounds, similar to me, um, and I knew how to separate myself from the crowd, but still focus on you know, what I'm looking to do. Wow, congratulations. Um, I think 
for yeah. for you to come out of school that only 50% got A to C grades in mm-hmm. GCSE and the success that you've amassed so far. And you actually made it all the way to university and you're currently studying business and management and entrepreneurship, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And um, what's it like studying that course? Um, because as people say that entrepreneurship is not about the theory, it's not about, you know, reading or writing, it's about taking action. So what mm-hmm. do you actually learn on your course? Yes, I think uni in general is a fantastic experience. I know you're at um, a very good uni as well. Um, but I think, first of all, outside of uni, it's the independence. You know, a lot of us are used to being fed by our parents, looked after 24-7, and even in school. But when you're in university, if you don't go to lectures, <laughs> no one's really going to get on to you. Um, so it's a thing where I learned a lot more of my independence. I've always enjoyed cooking, but even then, going to uni, learning about cooking, actually going out for yourself. And I guess it just makes you grow up a lot faster. In addition, I'd say networking, that's probably been one of my favourite aspects of university, you know, being in a different city, networking with international students and um, different people in the area, seeing what they've done and, again, what their parents do. Um, that has instilled me, you know, great inspiration to continue to um, do well in life. So yeah, uni's been a good experience. In, in regards to actual the theory, I think with me, I think you can learn from any, anything and from everyone. So I think with uni, I've definitely learned a lot of skills which I can apply to my business and which I have applied to my business, Um such as managing people, managing staff, um, how to grow accounts. So it's been a very good experience. And with my module, um, I had one module actually, and we'll talk about it probably later, about the Gen Z Club. So as I do business management entrepreneurship, we had a module where we could actually create our own business. So that's kind of when the idea of the Gen Z Club, which has always been in the back of my mind, that's when I was able to actually put it to practical use and you know get different, we call them dragons, to look over our business plan to see where we can edit. And that's when I eventually launched it, sorry, um, early in 2021. Wow, yes. And this is the right time to talk about it. So you actually run two different businesses now. You run DJ Property Solutions that provides um, property deals such as rent to rent, um, joint ventures, and I think service accommodation. And now you've also founded the Gen Z Club. So, um, and you've you've created value in, in both sort of business areas both affairs so um i'm really interested to know that what it's, it's about community right because i think mm-hmm. um especially with your business not only do you have a business but you actually have a community around your business so yeah. can you talk to me about how you build a community how have you became so valuable that people are willing to follow you join you and even go to further extents to buy courses or or you know take up some mentorship from you yeah, so I'll say first, if I'm starting with property, um, the way I was able to provide value, so as you mentioned with sourcing, um, I am the middleman to you know match investors with great property deals. So I decided to myself, I want to make sure that I focus on a niche and actually provide that value. So what I was able to do is actually find my investors first, identify their common needs and make sure that I provide a solution, not just to take their money and to sort of go on my day, but throughout the whole process, and even afterwards to ensure that they are fully satisfied. Um, with the Gen Z Club, I think when I started it um, through Clubhouse Rooms, which you were on as well, um, that was just initially to you know, bring entrepreneurs together um, to talk about thought-provoking topics. Um, and then as, as we go along, I think what's helped me to build that community is not focusing on the money. So with, with the Gen Z Club, I haven't really focused on the money side of things. I just f- focused on providing value and putting myself in the shoes of our guests, you know, what, would I want if I was a part of a community? So that's kind of what's helped me to, you know, the longevity of the company. So you provide value to both communities, but what exactly, or should I say, how exactly do you provide value? Yeah, so good question. So with the Gen Z Club, the way we provide value is through, initially was through Clubhouse Rooms, as I mentioned, but now through networking events. So our mission is to empower and inspire young people. Um, so Gen Z is 18 to 24 year olds, for those who don't know. And we just want to promote um, a platform of growth to so bring them together through resources, through different opportunities that they can learn and apply to their lives um, to increase personal development. In regards to my property um, services, really what we're doing is making it hassle-free for the investor. So we can allow, you know, so professionals who we usually work with, though they may be capital rich, but they may lack the time and knowledge. So we provide them a stress-free process to ensure that they're finding good returns on their investments um, whilst building generational wealth. So we don't want to just leave them in the mud. We want to make sure that they have that full security throughout the whole process um, when building their wealth. Yes, and for people like me who see your page on Instagram and I see the 
property pages and I'm thinking, wow, this is great. They're probably making a lot of money, but I don't exactly know what you do. Mm. So I, I go on your link and I join a group chat. So you have a WhatsApp group chat and yeah. um, I think there's over 200 members there and people are posting daily. So can you explain to me what that group chat is for? How did you get the 200 members and what, why did they post? Like, what's the value taken out of that group chat? Yeah, so um, I have a WhatsApp and Facebook group chat. And essentially, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot about community. So I wanted to provide a community where people can be posting different deals, um, have access to many investors and, you know, potentially do some joint ventures and collaborations. So I made a group chat to, um, I think it was about two years ago. And literally, the way I agreed was just through mainly through referrals. Um, I approached people who I already knew in the industry. I promoted on social media. And so initially started as, some deals were similar to me, posting deals, investors, you know, um, buying it. And now now even more so, there's a lot of people who've been collaborating together. They've been um, managed to make financial freedom for themselves. So it's been a very good um, platform. And you also released a course, I believe, that was a free course on property. So um, mm-hmm. if you're listening and you're interested in you know, learning much more about property and how you can make income, especially with um you know, little money as they call it, no money down or low money down, make sure to subscribe to the newsletters. We'll be linking the property course in there with exclusive tips from Denzel as well. But um, you created this property course. What was it like creating a course? Um, How long did it take you? How did you ensure that you are providing as much value Mm -hmm. as possible in that course? Yeah, good question. Um, I think initially the reason I created the course is because once I had um, some success with my property journey at a young age, a lot of people's reaching out to myself and my friend Poku, who at the time um, I created it with. Um, so initially, we didn't know how to deal with the demand of requests for people asking us to mentor them and stuff. However, as we were still quite young and early on in our journey, we didn't want to actually charge for mentorship. And I think with the property industry, there's a lot of controversy over people charging you know, premium amounts for property. So we thought, why don't we document our journey, but in like a course form where people can learn from our, from our experience? Um, so, yeah, it, it was quite a good at, um, outcome, to be fair. I think right now we have about over 2,000 enrolls um, of people from all over the world um, who are actually applying what we've learned um, and what we've shared with them um, to their lives. So, yeah, it's been very good. Wow. So you have 2,000 people who's enrolled into the course? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, and, and, and that just goes to show the value that you've provided in that course. And this is completely free? Yeah, completely free. And... I have declined a lot of mentorship because people have asked me to um, actually pay mentorship, but I've always been a person thinking, you know, I want to provide as much value as I can first. And then when I actually want to do mentorship, I'll put my all into it because I like doing things half-heartedly. And I know that I could have made quite a bit of money from mentorship, but I wanted to make sure that when I'm actually doing the mentorship, I can give my sort of all my time one-to-one and actually ensure that they grow rather than just charging them a premium just for the sake of getting money. Wow. I think that's a, a unique perspective i've never sort of really heard about someone who's rejecting potential income because i believe like they're not ready or they don't want to you know fall short of the value that they can provide because it's sort of an unusual answer to say that you're getting a lot of demand for mm. your mentorship for people who want to basically walk in your shoes and and, mm. and become more more successful at, at least break into the property industry but you're rejecting that so like do you have any conflict with yourself in terms of um, some people you should mentor, some people you shouldn't, or is it sort of just straight no, no mentorship? Well, it's a good question, but I'll, uh, I'll say firstly, one thing I care a lot about is reputation. So as Warren Buffett says, it takes a decade to build reputation and it's second to destroy one. So I know that if I'm just taking on people for the sake of it, I'm finding with, you know, not as much value, although I'm getting paid long term, my name will be ruined in the industry. So when it came to mentorship, um, I think sometimes this can be detrimental to myself. I do offer a lot of my time for free. Um, and it's just, you know, having calls um, with people. But I think more recently is when people told me, you know, Denzel, you know, you've got a lot of value to provide. You should actually start charging. So I, I still haven't really charged for mentorship. There's a couple of people that I do help for free. And I say because they offer value back. And this is something that I recommend to a lot of people. Even if you don't have the money to actually pay for mentorship, see what value you can bring to someone. So for example... There were, I'm not going to mention a name, but there was someone who reached out to me, um, I think it was about two months persistently on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on WhatsApp. And they said, you know, Denzel, I'll do anything to be mentored by you. And what they did was they managed my social media in return for my mentorship. So they didn't pay for me, but they were still providing me some kind of value, which I was then happy to actually, you know, give them value back. Not just someone asking me, um, oh, Denzel, can you teach me everything? 
that you know about property. So just making sure that I think with everything in life, it's always a win-win situation where you know you're benefiting, but also the person you're going to is also benefiting as well. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I can now see why your slogan is win-win solutions for DJ Property Solutions. But um, you touched on something very key. You talked about reputation and why that's so important. Can you just sort of dive deeper into that? So how important is reputation if you are entering um, the property market, trying to sell deals, as you say, or trying to um, get um, good deals to investors for them to invest? How important is this reputation? Yeah, reputation is key because at the end of the day, um, a lot of business, or, or for me personally, the best business actually comes from referrals. Um, and that's because if someone's actually come to you for a service and you've over-delivered, they're going to recommend you to their friends and it's going to have the ripple effect. Now, there's a lot of times where people have been exposed in the industry for actually, you know, just ripping people off, taking their money, running off of their money. And that's something they don't really want to touch with your um, business because that won't just affect you short term, but that'll affect you long term with any future deals because... People don't really forget these things, you know. They, they, you may think, okay, it was a year ago, I can get away with it. But if you're now going to deal with someone, um, people often do their checks on you. And if they see so, many neg- so much negativity about you, they're unlikely to do business with you. So that's why I think God, reputation, you want to guard it as much as possible. You know, don't don't um, let your re- reputation slip just for a little bit of money. It's, it's not worth it. Wow, that's very, very key. I think in a world that we live in, that. Uh, it's kind of like a casino, right? There's still mm-hmm. opportunities to win money everywhere, but um, some people that get too greedy, um, you know, actually might be to their downfall and you've upheld your reputation and you've remained of this, you know, valuable individual. Hence why you're on this podcast already dropping a lot of good information. But um, for somebody that's listening and wants mm-hmm. to actually get a better insight into how you built up your reputation, how did you actually do that? Like, what is it behind the scenes that we don't know? How many hours did you put into um, your knowledge, um, a mass of knowledge in the area of property or mass of knowledge in the area of entrepreneurship or anything mm-hmm. that helped you become where you are today? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's a, quite a few things. So with anything that I do, even when I started the Gen Z Club more recently, I would look to see someone in the industry who's doing it the way I want to do it. And then I'll, I'll copy their foundations and then put my own twist to it. So when it came to property, um, and as I mentioned, I want to be an architect before, what I'll do is I'll go on LinkedIn and DM everyone who I know who's doing well in property. And it just started off with me having calls with them, um, you know, checking up on them regularly, building that relationship to ensure that I actually get the great understanding that I need with property. Um, in addition, I would also have um, podcasts, attend networking events, which is very key, and just, I guess, immerse myself in the industry that I want to go into. So... That's something that's helped me along the way. Um, networking, you know, they say you're only seven people away from anyone in the world. So if you want to connect with the greatest developer, you should, you know, start with maybe networking horizontally with your peers, with people just a little bit above you, and then go on to the larger scale people. So that's something that's, I would say, was key in my journey. Networking, you know, that's something that you can't underestimate and I, I encourage everyone to do. Yes, you've actually mentioned networking quite a few times on this um, podcast. So um, I can obviously tell that networking has been profound in terms of your journey. Um, For somebody listening, that it's not necessarily property they want to get into. How can networking benefit them in terms of getting closer to whatever they do want to get into? I think networking is so key. And that's even how I've met you. And along my journey, you've helped me so much um, in different uh, industries. And that's something I'll say as well. Don't just think you should only network with people in your industry. Um, me and you, we're not in the same industry, but you've helped me in so many ways in regards to personal development, um, in regards to my journey. So I'll say when it comes to networking, just surround yourself with people who you want to be like. So, you know, there's a famous saying, if you surround yourself with five rich people, you'll be the six. Um, five, I don't know, hooligans, you'll be the six hooligans sort of thing. So just making sure that you're putting yourself in a position where, and networking is not just about your friends. It's about, I think, what you consume, what you allow yourself to consume. You know, if you're always listening to sort of negative music, watching negative type of things, then that's just going to be in your brain constantly. But if you surround yourself with, you know, positive music, um, positive podcasts, positive events, positive environments, then in general, then you'll be a positive person as well. So I think networking has helped me a lot. And even when it comes to the Gen Z club, that's something that I encourage people as well. So when I started the Gen Z club, initially I was doing it by myself. But then I was thinking this is not progressing as much as I want it to progress. And also it's a bit difficult to manage with my property and my university. And then I came across this quote which said, if you go, you can go fast alone, but if you can go, if you want to go long, you can go together. 
So that's when I collaborated with Austin and Poku, who I now run a Gen Z club with. And it's helped us in so many different ways because it's a thing where we're all focused on the same goal, but we have different perspectives. So although it may cause initially we disagree on certain things, but that way we get the most value out of it because we're all working towards the same goal, coming at it from different angles. So networking is probably the most important thing for me in my journey, I'll say. Networking from my first mentor to people I've talked to today, men, um, networking has been crucial. Yes, and that's so true. I think when you even say networking, people think, oh, it's a, you know, it's a corporate term or it's a yeah. business term. But like you said, we are in contact right now because we networked and just for full transparency on the podcast. So Denzel just DM'd me. And this is for anybody listening, like don't air your DMs or at least go through them. Or if you're the person that's trying to shoot your shot, DM people. Mm. <laughs> it's not necessarily um, on a romantic sort of tip, but it can actually be, you know, a form of networking, trying to literally get in contact with someone to see whether they can help you, you can help them if there's any synergies in that relationship. And I think um, I was speaking to another guest previously, Flynn, and he he literally talked about different ways to network as well. And he talked about how he doesn't just reach out to um, a person on one platform that he might DM, then he might send an email, then he mm. might you know, call, but it shows the, that he's keen to to really get in contact with this person rather than, rather than spamming them on the same one platform if they don't get a response, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that's so key because even in property, when we do something called direct-to-vendor marketing, um, it's essentially, you know, approaching a vendor um, directly to potentially acquire a property. And there's a famous rule which says there's seven points of contact. So for you to actually get through to someone, you need to contact them at least seven times for you to get through to them. So as you mentioned, they might be initially on Instagram, then LinkedIn, then you might see them in public, then, I don't know, through word of mouth. So... I think follow-up is very key. And when you network as well, there's no point networking with 100 people and not following up. And I remember when, I, when me and you first got in contact, we was catching up maybe, first of all, a week, then a month later, then, and just keeping that relationship um, because I feel like a lot of people value, I guess, quantity over quality. And I think you should have both, but I think quality is something they should really focus on. Like I, I personally would have rather have 10 good people in my network than just 20 people who I never talk to. Um, so definitely focus on that quality. And building that reputation um, within that. Yes, and we can tell by the way you speak and, and when you talk about quality, you talk about purpose, you talk about mm-hmm. um, how you really want to provide value so you won't just go out there half-hearted. And you also mentioned um, something about you like to, I guess, copy the foundations of someone who you would like to be, then you yeah. give it a little twist or spin. And I think that's such a a good way of going about things because there's this quote that says success leaves clues. Yes. Meaning mm-hmm. that all these successful people, right? Their, their success is not so hidden because we live in the, in an age where you can type in somebody's name. I mean, if they've reached a certain level, you can find information about them or at least when they, when they leave clues, they leave clues in the sense of podcasts, like you said, or in the sense of books or courses mm-hmm. or even, um, a diary (laughs) whatever Mm -hmm. it might be so I think um people overlook the simplicity in just thinking about okay I have this goal or I have this project I have this plan how do I get started what you want to do is find the clues of someone who's done it before because nine times out of ten someone's done it before and um instead of instead of doing that they will try to put all the pieces together and just get lost in the source (laughs) so Mm -hmm. um and again, I'll be full transparency. So even with this podcast that you're listening to right now, when I thought about making the podcast, I thought, okay, who do I listen to and who can I make a structure of? And, you know, one podcast came to mind, which was The Diary of a CEO by Stephen Bartlett. You know, I yeah. thought that was a great podcast. He, there was a lot of value in that podcast. I like the way he interviewed his guests. I like the way he asked questions to really get in in touch with the the person, right? Not just the career, not just the the whatever they do but actually the person instead and it brought out the best of the conversation so I thought okay when I plan my podcast I'm going to try structure it just like that or I'm going to add my little spin on things and so far so good because we're having valuable conversations so um um, thank you for getting on and um who who have you looked up to in in your journey or who have you said that's influenced you because I explained about you know Stephen Bartlett influenced me but who's influenced you in your journey so far um, well, there's, there's different areas of my life for different people. Um, I'll say initially, as I mentioned, my family. So 
my mum, she really taught me the importance of helping others, networking, doing your best, being authentic. My brother, um, he taught me a lot about 1% each day, staying consistent, focusing on your goal. Um, my dad has inspired me a lot in regards to etiquette, you know, waking up early, dressing well. And it, in terms of business, I would say um, Tony Robbins, he's been someone that's been very inspirational to me. Um, just everything that he's about, you know, I can really resonate with. Ed Milet as well, he's someone who's strong in business, but also shares openly about his faith. So good to see how he sort of intertwines them together. Um, Bishop Jakes, as you know, um, when it comes to a spiritual faith, he's someone I look up to. So there's, there's quite a few people, and there's a lot of people in my ge- uh, in my network, both friends and both celebrities who look up to me. But I think with me, I just like to get a little bit of everyone. Um, I like to get like, a little bit of, I might like, I don't know, say say the way that you speak. I like the way someone else um, conducts himself in a business environment. And just put it together, because as you mentioned, success leaves clues. Um, you know, have that foundation, but then put my own unique twist to it as well. Yes, it looks like you've got a lot of different people pouring into you and helping you in different sort of areas. And I think that's very, very key. And also, it sounds like you have different friendship groups as well. So um, talk to me a bit about how you manage relationships, whether that be family, whether that be personally, you know, community, romantically. How, like, how do you go about that? And has there been any sort of um, conflict um, with relationships while you were trying to manage not just your personal life, but also um, your business? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that's what a lot of young people actually struggle with growing up. And to be completely honest, I think initially it was quite difficult because certain people I knew I was surrounding myself at the start with, I knew that if I wanted to get to where I wanted to get to, I have to separate myself from them. And I know that that can lead to, I guess, them subconsciously thinking that you think that you're too big time or that you don't want to chill them because you think you're too good for them, which wasn't the case. It's just that you need to know who you need to surround yourself with and not get involved in certain things to actually progress to the next level. So I'll say growing up, a lot of my friends I'm still very close with today. Um, and a lot of my friends, we're all kind of on the same journey, but in different industries. So a lot of my friends are clothing brands, some are music artists, um, others are doing property. But essentially, I usually group it into, i say, three different categories. I have some friends who are strictly just business. Like we don't really chill on a social thing. We're just... When we talk, it's literally just about business. Our friends who are, we don't really talk about business. Like It's just like, if I want to have a good time and relax, I'm chilling with them. Then I have friends, like people like you, who are a bit of both. Like We talk about business, but we can also chill and have discussions or go out together. So I think it's just about the right place and the right time, knowing, because sometimes I didn't want to talk about business. And I think that's something that I used to not like as well. Because I got into business so young, people wouldn't necessarily be talking to me for the sake of Denzel, but more because I'm a property guy. So I'd be like, I'll be at a party. I remember uni first, I was at a party. There's me just trying to enjoy. Oh, Denzel, can you teach me about property? And that's something I just used to hate. Like, I just like, oh, like, I don't just, obviously, it's, I'm grateful that people are recognising me for what I'm doing, but I just wanted to have that kind of separation for, you know, my downtime and actually building a relationship. So, yeah, when it comes to family as well, I'll say I'm, I'm very much a family-oriented guy. So when it comes to family, I'm always checking up on the aunties, uncles, cousins, and trying to organise. So as you see with the Gen Z club, trying to organise things together. That's the same with, with my family, just trying to put people together, um, do things with our family. So, yeah, I value relationships so much. I think that's probably the most important thing in my life, um, just make sure I have good relationships with people around me. Yes, that's, that's so good to hear. And I, I like the fact that you said that it's not just in business like you like bringing people together, but you actually play an active role in bringing your family together because I think, you know, yeah. family is very, very important. And you even touched a bit about how, you're at parties and some people mm-hmm. just really think you're the property guy, right? DJ mm-hmm. or Denzel, you know, Denzel property. And um, so how how do you, I guess my question is like, how do you stray away from that? Um, mm-hmm. Like you said, you have many different friends and I think it's important. In fact, it's important that you have different friends to meet different needs. And I think for yeah. anybody that's listening, I'll definitely recommend that because I think that's the same as you grow older in life. You start to see that, you know, you get on or you get on well with certain type of people. However, because you made friends so young and these friends are growing up with you, um, mm. you don't just want to abandon them. And some people yeah. might have that approach that they just, you know what, <laughs> this is the end of the road. It's been good. Um, you know, I hope you get on well with your life and they just sort of, you know, turn turn the next path or go on to, go on to a next path. So um, I think the question I was going to ask you is that um, h- how do you overcome 
being known as for only one thing for the property guy or the property entrepreneur like do you communicate that you do other things is this something you generally openly talk about or do you actually find yourself doing other things like what are your sort of passions your hobbies your interests outside of business outside of property and um, of course outside of being a family man yeah i think that's a good question i think that's probably one area of my life which um i'm actually still working on because it's a thing where yeah, I, I, I still am very much known as Denzel the Entrepreneurial Guy, but I think people who know me a long time know me as the fun guy who, you know, likes to enjoy himself, who likes to play football, who likes to chill and relax. So I think that's something which I've, I guess, I, I don't know if it's struggling with because the thing where certain things that I was doing when I was younger doesn't really interest me anymore. So it's a thing where, like, what I'm doing right now, I'm quite focused on, you know, the goal that I have at, at in mind so I'm just focused on doing the things I need to do to get there now obviously in my downtime there's things I do like chilling with my friends playing football um just yes just doing things that maybe have cooking I like cooking um but yeah I think that's something that I still need to work on actually find that balance of you know okay cool I'm a property guy I'm a business guy but let me actually still you know stay true to my core personality and not get that lost in the journey Yes, and you sound like a well-rounded individual in the sense that, yes, you can play sports, yes, you can do business, yes, you can study, yes, you spend time with your family, yes, you can cook, you know, bonus for any of the ladies <laughs> that are listening. Um, but you also go to the gym as well. So, like, um, you do a range of things and you like to, you know, keep, I guess, a, a well-balanced, holistic, sort of healthy lifestyle. And you mentioned that you set goals as well. And I just wonder, like, what are the type of goals you set? Of course, we've just entered a new year, 2022, mm-hmm. um, and you've entered the year already sourcing 2 million plus worth of properties. So um, talk to me about the next step or what, what's next for you. Yeah, so I'll, I'll quickly touch on what you mentioned about the goals. Um, so the way I um, structure my goals is similar to what you said. So I start with the end in mind. So I usually have like my five-year plan, three-year plan, one-year plan, and then I have it into a 12-week year. So every time I set my goals, I group into health, finances, education, spiritual and personal development slash relationships. So when it comes to the 12-week year, for those who don't know, you may have your one-year goal, but then you break it down into 12 weeks. And the reason you do that is so that you can be intense. Because let's say you have a goal now of, um, I don't know, making X amount per year you might be a bit slack you might be slacking a bit throughout the year but then when it comes to november you're like oh damn i'm quite far away from my um, goal let me just go hard to get it however if you break that yearly target into 12 weeks every 12 weeks you're working on that same urgency to actually get those goals and with the 12 week year you have accountability partners and that's something which i recommend has helped me a lot of my journey so um i usually do pokey banks for those who <laughs> most people probably know so he's my t- uh, he's my accountability partner so every week we catch up um, and we just make sure that we're on track with our goals. But that was working very well. But at the same time, I said, I want more accountability because I think I work well under pressure. So what I did was I have accountability partners for every area of my life. So when it comes to gym, I've got a gym accountability partner, property, I've got property accountability partners, uni accountability partners. And that way I know that I can't really slack because when we do, our, and even with us, like we're in the same wake up um, <laughs> group chat. So like in the morning, if we wake up late, the man will get onto us saying, oh, like, we wake up at 8 a.m. the same good evening. Like, so you can't even wake up, <laughs> you can't even wake up too late. So it's a thing where having that counter, and that's if you work well under pressure, but it, it may be working you know, different for someone else. But that's what's helped me a lot, actually stay accountable to my goals. And you know, even if I don't achieve them, I set them quite um high. So even if I don't achieve them, I know that I'll still be further than if I were to um set them quite low. So that's what's helped me a lot um achieve my goals. Yes, accountability partners. Um, no, being in that, I think is nearly is it nearly a year that we're in this yeah. morning group chat. Mm. It's nearly a year. So for the listeners, yet yeah, I'm in the group chat with Denzel and a few others, and we basically hold each other accountable to waking up early because I genuinely believe that if you wake up earlier, and that depends. So I I was originally waking up on average around nine a.m. Um, depending whether you know I'm on holiday, I'm in school. In university or school or whatever but um waking up at 6 a.m has definitely changed um the game because i get more things done um i wouldn't really say i'm an early riser or a late owl i feel like i just work on energy levels if i've not got enough sleep i won't really function well in the day but um accountability partners is, is very important is there any um any tools you use that helps you with accountability 
Yeah, and to, and to add on to what you said as well, and I'll go back to what you just asked me, I think what's very key, which you mentioned, is doing what works best for you. I think because of internet's always saying, wake up at 5 a.m., do this, do that. Sometimes people are doing a lot, but not actually getting a lot done. So what, what I noticed is that I was waking up at 5 a.m., but by 12 p.m., I'm tired. I want to sleep sort of thing. So I said, what similar to you? So now mine's about 6 a.m. to 6.30 is where I know that I wake up, I'm still early, but I've got enough energy to do what I need to do. So I feel like don't just think, oh, I need to copy everyone else or look like I'm being busy, but actually do what works for you and find a, um, the right system that works. But um, to ask your question about accountability partner, I think it's just system. So a lot, not, you might not believe, but naturally I'm actually quite a lazy person. So what I do is just have systems in place to actually help with that laziness. So for example, I know it's very easy to put my snooze on in the morning. Because um, I've got two phones, one of my phones, I'll put it in some difficult place to get. So in the morning when my alarm's gone off, I can't just turn it off. I have to literally get up, go walk across my room and turn it off. Um, similarly, like if I want to go to gym in the morning, I'll have my gym clothes ready. So that way, when I wake up and the gym clothes is looking at me, I know I have to literally pull it on and go to gym. So just creating systems um, in place because, and I think that's the importance of discipline because motivation will only help you a certain way. And that's where most people, when they start the year, the gym's packed. February, March time, the gym's empty. And that's because people have run out of motivation. But um, there's a famous quote by James Clear, which says, you do not rise to the level of your goals, but to, you fall to the level of your systems, which means that the discipline that you have in place, when motivation isn't working, that discipline, you know, is what will stand in your life. So I think that's very important just have the routines in place that you know will benefit you and just, just make it unique to yourself. Don't just think, oh, I have to do what um, this person's doing or that person's doing. Just do what works best for you. Yes, and James Clare, who who is that, and how has he had impact on your life um, in terms of this system methodology? So James Clare, he's the author of a book called Atomic Habits, and that's one of my books I always recommend to people. And it's just teaching about you know one percent each day, and he just breaks down how you can add systems and discipline in your life to actually progress. So, for example, one thing that he says that is really good is that don't have a goal of go gym twice a week but you've got to adopt the identity of a regular gym goer so you know i am a regular gym goer who loves going gym that way if you're a regular gym goer who loves going gym you're going to automatically go gym various times a week same with if you're healthy eating or or, or whatever goal you have you've got to adopt the identity not just have that goal because if you just have that goal you're separating yourself from that goal but if you have that identity you're actually becoming the person who will achieve those type of things wow that is powerful. <laughs> that That is very, very powerful. I, I never actually thought about it like that because I think the common thing we do, especially in 2022, is that we're setting goals and we set, you know, like you said, short-term, long-term goals and we just run out trying yeah. to achieve them. And, and if we short if we fall short, we just say to ourselves, oh, don't worry, and, you know, mental health, we're taking care of ourselves. And to an aspect, you know, everybody should. But that idea of actually making it, adopting the identity as in, you know, it's not just about the goal. This is a lifestyle. Exactly. And this is how I want to play the, my lifestyle out. I actually want to change, you know, physically, mentally, socially, um, and emotionally for the better. And um, just talking about goals, just to bring that question back to you, so what are your goals for 2022? So 2022, um, similar, as I mentioned, you know, grouping into different goals. So I have it for different quarters, but I'll say in general, my big goals are um, final year of uni is this year. So by God's grace to graduate with first class, that's my, I guess, my educational goal. Um, sourcing is, a, I'm not going to say it, but it's a certain revenue goal, which I want to achieve in regards to sourcing properties. Um, also, I want to, myself and my uncle, we're going to be developing um, some houses to HMOs, as I mentioned, how, house and multiple occupancies. That's something I'm looking forward to. Gen Z Club, as you saw at our event on Friday, we're going to have something every single week. And I'm looking forward to most award ceremonies. So just, you know, make sure that we provide an, continue to provide an environment for youth to grow. Um, so yeah, different areas of my life I'm, I'm trying to improve on. But I'll say, what I usually like to do as well is I have like, three or four goals which will cover all my small goals so for example let's say i want to i don't know buy my mama a car do this do that if i achieve my revenue goal automatically i'll have enough money to buy my mama a car so i just have to focus on that i say the three or four which i think before i would have like 20 goals and then i wouldn't be able to focus on them so now i have about three or four goals which i'm committed to and as a result i'll achieve my other goals 
Wow, I never thought about it like that. So you actually bundle, you sort of um, bundle your goals together mm. and you make sure that if you achieve one goal, it'll sort out all the rest of the goals. All the rest of the goals, yeah. And you yeah. do that 12 weeks in a year to make sure you hit that one goal. Yeah, so I'll break, it down, I'll break it down. So let's say my target is X amount in revenue. I'll kind of divide it by four. And then for that 12 weeks, I don't think about the rest of the year, but for that 12 weeks, I'm working hard to achieve my 12-week goals. Um, and that's, that's what helped me a lot because you're working with a lot more intensity. Yes, yes, that makes sense. And for somebody who's listening and they're thinking, okay, 2022, I've heard great information and value on this podcast. That's it. I want to change my identity. I want to adopt a new identity. I want to become a highly valued individual by the end of 2022, that they want to launch into 2023, a completely different person, Mm -hmm. right? Give me some actionable, practical tips and advice that you'll give to a person who wants to make a change you know, a self-development sort of change and, and how would they start that journey? Good question. So this is what I get asked a lot. And I would say to people, the first thing is setting the foundation. So what I mean by that is the mindset. So making sure, as we mentioned earlier, you're surrounding yourself with the right people, you're, you know, anything that's negative in your life, you kind of put that away and then you just focus on the positive. And then with that, you now have to start with clarity. So what do you actually want? Because a lot of times we're working towards something that we don't even know what we're working towards. So you've got to have that in mind. Okay, this is exactly what I want. And one thing that I do is write it down because it's easy to imagine stuff, but until it's actually pen to paper, then it's non-existent. So I say, yeah, start with clarity. So what do you want? And write it down. And as I mentioned about, you've got to become the person who achieves a type of goal. So one thing that I like to do is um something we call taste of success. It's what I learned from Ed Milet. So let's say... I know in the future I want to live in a nice house, drive some nice cars. So what I used to sometimes do with my friends is I go out to some luxurious apartments in Knightsbridge. We go sit in Rolls Royce so I can just taste the success and know what it feels like to be that success. So even if that's not necessarily your goal, you know, whatever your goal is, just surround yourself with someone who's actually achieved that goal. See what they do, what things they get up to, and I guess mirror that. Once you get that foundation, you've got to make a plan. So that's where it comes to the goal setting what plan do I want to put in place to actually tackle these goals on a daily basis and then get someone accountable for you? So if you want to do it similar to me, have different goals for your um, health, your relationships, have accountability partners going to keep you accountable. And someone that's not going to, if you don't achieve it, say, oh, like, I don't rate you this or that, but someone who's just going to, like, encourage you and be like, okay, cool, you haven't achieved this. However, what can you do next time? And actually make you self-reflect to go further. Um, and then, yeah, once you've got your plan, your clarity in place, you just got to literally have tunnel vision, you know, work hard, learn when to rest, to recover and just keep going. But I think one thing that's so important is that you'll never change your life until you change what you do daily. I think a lot of times you think about the bigger picture, which is good, but you've got to think about what am I doing each day? Because everyone dreams to be a millionaire, but if a million was given to you right now, most people by a year's time don't have nothing to show for it. So it's about actually knowing what I'm doing daily, what systems I have in place. Because I think... God doesn't give us stuff for a reason until he knows that we're prepared for it. So just make sure that you have everything in place that you're actually prepared to achieve what you want to do in life. Wow, that is very, very powerful. So number one, laying the foundations. Mm. Number two, clarity. Clarity. And number three, tunnel vision, you know, Mm -hmm. coupled with working hard. And um, you've literally just broke that down in literally, I think, under a minute or a minute or two. But for somebody that's listening and really wants to dive deep with you i was just wondering if you were willing to offer you know one hour of your free time in order to help coach or help train or help mentor somebody or just give them that exclusive chance to get a q a session with you because we have our newsletters we have a great community and i'm sure someone will benefit from that so are you happy to do that yeah i'm um, anything for you boy definitely i'm down i'm down to do that man and also a quick plug literally not just me but there's so many people in i guess our age group because a lot of times people think, oh, for me to be successful in property or this, it's only, you know, the rich old guys who are doing this. But there's so many youngsters who have similar mindsets. Um, and so I think a quick plug, you know, the Gen Z club, a good community. It's got people in there who are such as Ayola, Austin, Poku, and various people who are doing big things, not just in property, but um, in e-commerce, in trade, in, in graduate schemes, you know. So just surround yourself with an environment and that's something that you can go to. We, we do host quite a few events. So just come along and network with people who can help you with your journey, I would say. 
Amazing, amazing. And so if you are listening and you're subscribed to the newsletter, I'll be putting out those details on how you can win a chance to sit down with Denzel for an hour and talk all things business, all things um, self-development, mindset, and how you can literally adopt a new identity and power through 2022, launching into great success in 2023. And on top of that, Denzel has just mentioned the Gen Z Club. Now, if you're listening and you want to get involved with like-minded individuals, I highly, highly recommend it. So I think you've launched, um, so far you've had three in-person events, um, if yeah. I'm correct, um, two in London, one in Nottingham, and you're going all across the UK this year in terms of different cities like Manchester. So um, yeah. can you just talk to me a bit about the plans so people know, you know, from all different areas where they can get connected and how can they find you on social media or how can they get involved in some of the challenges that you guys run? Yeah. So on Instagram, firstly, um, you can catch us at the dot Gen Z club, same on Twitter, but Instagram is our main platform in terms of events. So we just had a London event, um, literally two days ago. Um, but for those who want to go to our fair events, we're doing something every single month for the rest of this year. Um, so, I can't remember everything from the top of my head, but I know we're having like a crypto webinar in February. In March, I'm organising a property dinner, having some more webinars in April, May. Um, June, we're going to have a Birmingham event. So, because we've got people from different parts of the country, so we want to cater to that audience. July, we're having a good event um, with Purpose Ed. Um, I definitely recommend you guys listen to their podcast as well. Um, September, I think that's Manchester. We've got trading events. So, yeah, just definitely um, you follow our page. We've got quite a few updates. We do personal development challenges and then at the end of the year we're having an award ceremony so it's essentially we're going to bring together the best of the best from our age group we're going to have like podcast of the year which I hope you win bro we're going to have um entrepreneur of the year business of the year and it's just to I guess empower people as what our core message to empower people and to bring people together through a platform of growth Wow, that is amazing. And yes, you should catch me there at the award ceremony and some of the other events. And if you're listening, I would love to catch you there as well as we're all working together to provide value to each other and, you know, become valuable and Denzel has been such an amazing guest um, I'm so grateful that you've joined us on the valuable podcast and just to quickly close off if you were to um, give your last piece of advice to somebody who wanted to um, basically increase the value that they provide um, what would you advise I would say the most important thing is you know being true to yourself making sure that you're not faking anything just be authentic because at the end of the day that'll get caught out um, and I would say yeah just literally you know focus on your strengths see how you can improve them and what I like to do is focus on my strengths improve them and outsource my weaknesses so that I know that what I'm good at and which is for me personally is like networking bringing people together I'm doing that to the highest standard possible and the things that I'm not so good at which I can just outsource so that I can continue to provide value to people and I think just being authentic and I think authenticity goes a long way uh, make sure that you're always looking for a win-win situation. I'll always say that win-win situation. Whenever you're going to an agreement, a deal, a business, always look how the other person can benefit. Don't just think, I want to make quick money. Because, you know, money at the end of the day comes and goes. But a good relationship will last forever. So just, yeah, provide that value, um, win-win situation, and just stay true to yourself. Perfect. And you've heard Denzel Jones, win-win situations only. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Can you tell us where they can find you, follow you, support you, your personal platforms, as well as your business? Thank you both for having me, first of all. And um, LinkedIn, Denzel Jones, Instagram at dens.jj. And my property, so if you are looking to get property deals, you know whether you're an athlete, a busy professional, you want property deals, DJ Property underscore Solutions. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the Gen Z Club at the Dr. Gen Z Club. Um, all those platforms reach me out, reach out to me on sorry, um, and I'll definitely get in touch. Thank you for listening. If you like this episode, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and follow us on social media at Valuable Podcast. Last but not least, for exclusive detailed content, sign up for the weekly newsletter at www.valuablepodcast.com. Remember, Increase the value you provide and you'll rise in due time.